March 7. Exodus 18. Luke 21. Job 36. 2 Corinthians 6. One can only imagine the conversations that Moses had enjoyed with Jethro, his father-in-law, during the decades they spent together in Midian. But clearly some of the talk was about the Lord God. Called to his extraordinary ministry, Moses temporarily entrusted his wife and sons to his father-in-law's care. Exodus chapter 18, verse 2. Perhaps that decision had been precipitated by the extraordinary event described in Exodus chapter 4, verses 24 through 26, where in the light of this new mission, Moses' own sons undergo emergency circumcision to bring Moses' household into compliance with the covenant with Abraham, thereby avoiding the wrath of God. But now Moses learns that Jethro is coming to see him, restoring to him his wife Zipporah and their sons Gershom and Eliezer. Soon Moses continues the old conversation. This time he gives his father-in-law a blow-by-blow account of all that the Lord had done in rescuing his people from slavery in Egypt. Doubtless some of Jethro's delight, verse 9, is bound up with his ties with his son-in-law, but if his final evaluative comment is taken at face value— Jethro has also come to a decisive conclusion. Now I know that the Lord is greater than all other gods, for he did this to those who had treated Israel arrogantly. Verse 11. And he offers sacrifices to the living God. Verse 12. All this material is provided as background for what takes place in the rest of the chapter. The next day, Jethro sees Moses attempting to arbitrate every dispute in the fledgling nation. With wisdom and insight, he urges on Moses a major administrative overhaul, a rigorous judicial system, with most of the decisions being taken at the lowest possible level, only the toughest cases being reserved for Moses himself, the Supreme Court. Moses listens carefully to his father-in-law and puts the entire plan into operation. Verse 24. The advantages for the people who are less frustrated by the system and for Moses, who is no longer run ragged, are beyond calculation. And at the end of the chapter, Jethro returns home. In some ways, the account is surprising. Major administrative structures are being put into place among the covenant community without any word from God. Why is Jethro, at best on the fringes of the covenant people, allowed to play such an extraordinary role as counselor and confidant of Moses? The questions answer themselves. God may use the means of common grace to instruct and enrich His people. The sovereign goodness and provision of God are displayed as much in bringing Jethro on the scene at this propitious moment as in the parting of the waters of the Red Sea. Are there not contemporary analogies?